Hey there, gang. Got a classy black silver tone here. This is a 1427 model, sometimes called the Espanada, which is actually the name of its twin from the Harmony line, the H63, because this is a Harmony-made guitar. I don't know the date on this. It's probably around 1960. This model was made from 1955 until 1964. This guitar has a truss rod in it, so I know it's made after 56. Um, I'm not sure if the silver tone version ever had it, but the early Harmony Espinatas had um, binding that was made out of aluminum. It was very distinctive, which they stopped using in 1958. It's got some Gibson P13 pickups in it. These are single coils designed by Gibson in the early 40s to replace the Charlie Christian style pickups that they were using at that point, which are, well, they're very large and heavy and bulky things. They take up a lot of room on the inside of the guitar. Uh, these are much easier to design around, I imagine. Anyway, these were used in the ES-125s and ES-150s in the 1940s, and they are the predecessor to the P90. Very similar, slightly darker sounding. Um, they've got the metal covers with the raised band around the screws. And when Gibson decided to, I guess, upgrade, if you call it that, to the P90s, they sold off all of their leftover inventory to Harmony who just kept using it on these models. As you can see, this thing is in two pieces, which really isn't so bad in this case because it actually needs a neck reset. The owner says that it had a screw going through the end of the heel here, but it was sort of doubtful it was doing anything because it wasn't actually long enough to get into the neck block. But when he pulled that out, the two parts came right apart, you know, which is good news for me. Um, you have to be pretty careful with these necks when they're off the body because the extension support here is it's not physically attached to the neck like you would find on Gibson's or most other arch tops where this will be mortised into the end of the neck shaft. Here it's just glued on under the board. So with the fret kerf there at the 14th fret uh, usually being quite deep, you know, there's a scant 16th of an inch worth of wood at this point here. So, uh, and the end gets kind of heavy with this additional piece of wood on there, so they really want to break right there. Uh, kind of relying on the binding to hold everything together. So, you know, care must be taken. There is a crack in the side here that's been glued up with super glue, but not leveled all that successfully. So we'll try and tidy that up. I hope it didn't go all the way through the block, but I suspect it might have, so we might have to, again, bolster that area with some more glue. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few more interesting things to find along the way as we get into this. Don't you just love the cupcake knobs? I like them. I think I'm going to wrap the tailpiece in some paper towel, tape it up so that it's not tempted to come crashing down onto the finish at any point and damage it. This thing's in pretty good shape for a 60-year-old guitar. You know, just inspecting this crack here might be a good place to start because it does seem like it goes into the neck block. And if I'm not mistaken, it's also on the other side. If I was to remove some of that excess glue, I'm sure I'd find it. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens if you get a neck that's maybe a little bit loose and someone tries to remove it by wiggling it back and forth. Um, if you're not careful, I mean, all of the tension is focused on the end of the dovetail, and it acts like a lever. It can split the block. In this case, this is, I, it might be spruce or it could be poplar. But, you know, no match for the fulcrum advantage of a nice long neck. So, I think that's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to drill a couple of very small diameter holes and inject some glue into the block at this point and clamp it up. Just before I get into all the fitting or trying to remove the glue and stuff that's in there, um, good place to start. Here we have a 12-string Ibanez. I haven't had a 12-string on the bench for several months now. Missing that special brand of frustration that only a 12-string can produce. 
this is an attractive amber color. Uh, I don't know the model number. I think it's an RT. Uh, and the task is to swap out this bridge for an identical one that doesn't have some damage on one of the saddles. You can see it right here, how one of the wings is broken away. I mean, this thing is still fully functional as it is, but the owner has a bit of a collection going on and would like this to be in better shape for posterity. And as it turns out, this particular Goto bridge was discontinued a couple of years ago, but he managed to find one still on the shelf. It needs a setup. Twelve strings are by their nature a cantankerous machine. They don't make it easy for you. And the other thing is, dialing in a really nice setup is often too time-consuming for them to do at the factory. So there are a lot of 12 strings out there that are more difficult to play than they need to be. There's always a compromise between the fundamental strings and the octaves, both in intonation and in string height, um, and also in things like the height of the nut slots, too. There's a lot of fine-tuning that can be done, to the point where you're sometimes chasing your tail. This bridge is actually a pretty good design. I've seen it on a number of guitars, and I really like it. But it's not the first time I've seen one with damage. You know, the parts have to be thin by necessity to make it work, because they're cramming that octave string up right close to the uh, fundamental. You can't have an eighth-inch sidewall to the saddles. It's just not going to function. Maybe that's part of the reason they had to stop making them. Too many warranty returns. One of the questions about this guitar has to do with the saddles. Um, you can see they're quite tall, and the screws have been drawn out to basically the end of their travel. So the question is, this guitar does seem to have a shim in the neck pocket. Is that shim necessary? Um, or maybe it could be a thinner shim? We, we shall see. This is the kind of experiment it's nice to do with the original strings on. I'll slacken these off and uh, we'll loosen the screws and take that shim out and see what happens. I'll pop a capo on to try and keep them in some kind of order. Okay, it's got a Stumac 0.5 degree shim in there. Let's see what happens without it. Well, clearly a shim of some thickness is necessary, because uh, this isn't even at full tension, and we're currently sitting at around 10 64ths. So, yeah, maybe we can thin that shim out a little bit, and see what happens if I drop the saddles all the way down to the deck. So, yes, even at its lowest workable point, the action is still kind of outrageous at 8 64ths. So it needs the shim. What I can do is um, take a little bit off the current one. So measuring this, it tapers over 75 millimeters of length from just under 50 thousandths to somewhere around 10 thousandths. Uh, let's reduce that by, say, 15-20%. And that should get us into a nice, comfortable working height. I took all the screws out of the bridge and encountered resistance. Rather than just having the ground wire loose and held by pressure, they soldered it on with solder to the bridge base. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does mean I have to take all the screws out of the pickguard to get at the wire. I scuffed up the area on the bottom of the bridge and replicated their technique by sticking down a piece of conductive copper tape. Solder, or solder, doesn't like to stick to the chrome plating, but it does like the copper. I'll just call attention to something here. I got the two screws at the front installed, and then I was sighting down the ones at the back of the bridge, and something seemed funny, because I couldn't see holes. I could see, like, indents for a pilot drill, and that's exactly what they are. For some reason, the holes in the original bridge are a couple of millimeters forward of the new one. But strangely, the guitar has been punched for the spacing of the replacement, which is very nice of them. I just have to drill them out. Um, I really should go ahead and fill the original holes, though, to do it right, because they're very close, and I wouldn't want them to sort of wander or break out or anything.
Just about every guitar I see benefits from some fret polishing. It's a contemplative time. A shot for the Ibanez fans. I'm not sure what all this means, other than the shim angle there. That seems pretty obvious. It's just a little long and a little thick. I'll sand it, mark it, and cut it to size. With thin veneer, multiple light passes are the way to go. Try to cut through in one stroke and you'll find out all about grain direction. Let's be helpful to future generations. I could draw something obscene here, but I won't. On this bridge, half the strings are top loaded and the other half go through the body. And they were devil may care with the positioning. Intonation next. It takes twice as long as usual, but this is a 12 string that you can get right in tune with itself, which isn't always the case. It's kind of nice. Obviously slacken the strings before moving the saddles. The octaves are adjusted just like miniature Floyd Rose saddles from above. Something arises. You can see by the hole in the headstock there in the middle that this used to have what I assume was a string tree or retainer. Without it, this happens. A sitar-like buzzing on the D string. And the octave G creates a pinging sound as it slides back and forth across the bottom of the groove. This is because the long straight headstock creates a pretty shallow angle for those middle strings and not enough downward pressure. So, you know, I do have a string retainer here. The only one I've got at the moment is this rather nice roller one, which uh, I think will function. It's narrow enough, if placed in that area. So, yeah, let's give that a try. Some of the nut slots for the fundamental strings are much higher than they need to be. So we should take that down. It's actually quite difficult to play in the lower positions. You almost can't blame them at the factory for leaving them high because going too low with one slot is just disastrous. Because making a new one of these nuts is... I mean, I'm sure they buy them in bulk, but still, setting a nut up like this takes forever on a 12 string. Yeah, that's better. The thing is there can be a real discrepancy between the heights of the strings and when you go to grab one during a chord you grab that fundamental and it takes a while before you reach the octave. It feels kind of unsecure in your footing. So it's nice if you can get the tops of the strings fairly close to each other. In the same plane I mean. Alright, that's enough to cure my 12 string cravings for a little while. We'll plug it in and see what it sounds like. There's a whole lot of glue to clean out of the pocket here. I think they're relying on it more than the fit of the actual parts to keep things together. And the area of the extension wedge doesn't seem like it was ever seriously prepped to fit the soundboard. So I decided to make it reasonably flat to give me a bit of a head start when shimming it. I'll put the body in my padded cradle to start addressing the side crack. There's a real hump of glue, so I'll scrape it down with a razor blade the corners protected with tape. Hmm, I'm getting a strong smell of blue cheese. 
not mold, but like cheese. That's not the appropriate thing to use for filling a crack like this. This crack was pretty far out of alignment when glued. I got rid of most of the discrepancy and uh, I'll sand with 400 grit to prep the surrounding lacquer for the new stuff that's going to go on top. It's barbaric, but it's controllable. While we're here, I'll just call your attention to these black splotches. This isn't just paint that's transferred or got someplace it shouldn't have been. This is black fill. And there's a lot of it because super accurate fitting wasn't really on the table for them during construction. It wasn't a priority. They got it close and then they stuffed in some black putty to fill in the gaps. This can make getting a refined fit mm, difficult, shall we say, because the parts didn't necessarily align perfectly when they were new. Uh, and then there's been deforming that's taken place since, so we can do our best. That's all you can do. I'll tape the bridge in position to allow me to scope out the situation without having it wander around on me. Let's talk about setting necks on arch tops. On flat tops, you've heard me talk about projecting a line from the top of the frets to the top of the bridge, and it's quite similar for these as well. Um, the soundboards react slightly differently in arch tops under tension, and it's good to account for that. I didn't get a chance to see this thing with strings on it, and the fit of the dovetail isn't really good enough for me to try it out now, so I'm going to have to do a bit of a guesstimation. Because all of the string force presses down on an arch top, and add to that the folding force that pulls up on the neck and the tail, I can expect the bridge to dip under tension a certain amount. So, all being equal, if I project a line from the top of the frets that coincides with the top of the saddle when it's cranked all the way down on the adjusters, I know that I will end up with a considerable amount of these adjustment screws showing when it's got the strings on it because I have to raise the saddle enough to create the action or the space between the strings and the frets. So roughly 5 30 seconds of an inch plus whatever deflection occurs in the soundboard. That's difficult to judge. Possibly another 30 second of an inch. So really I want the projected line to end up about 3 16 of an inch below the top of the saddle. That should get me in the ballpark. You know, I'll have plenty of upward adjustment left in the screws at that point. If I was to put strings on this thing now, in order to get a decent action, I would probably have the bridge raised like this. That's too high. When we talk about neck resets on arch tops, it's often not because the action itself is too high per se, but rather we run out of adjustment on the bridge screws because the top has become sunken or the neck has pulled up. Now there are a number of different situations and various ways of dealing with this. This end pin has been glued in very securely. I can't pull it out without damaging it. So I'm going to put on a little block here uh, to raise that off the bench. So I'm not putting all of the pressure just on that end pin, which could possibly, you know, stress or do damage to the interior block. So, you know, I've got a good solid base on which I can rest the guitar. Just have a look at the fit to begin with. Uh, there's a gap at the top, there's a gap at the back, so it's possible there's a slight hump in this area in the center, which doesn't surprise me given the crack that went through the sides. Uh, if I try to fit it like this, mm, it's very difficult because I've got sort of point contact in the center. I'm going to start removing material in the middle rather than at the end. So it might be beneficial for me to try and file this center area out a little bit. Okay, that's much flatter than it was. Okay, I stopped, I took a 15 minute coffee break and I thought about it because there are just too many variables involved here with this neck in this condition. I don't know how it's going to respond 
under string tension. And that's just too big a gamble for me. Because it's possible the neck bends forward enough somehow to offset the issue with having the, um, the bridge too high. So, eh, I'm thinking the best thing for me to do is probably to put a screw into the neck block there, as was previously attempted, and just to hold it in, in place to see what happens when I put strings on it. It seems the safest course of action. I'll plug it afterwards, it'll be okay. Okay, this bears out the hypothesis. With the base of the neck pulled tight up against the body and the adjustment screws on the bridge bottomed out, the strings are flat on the fingerboard. So let's raise them and see what happens to the bridge. Also, note how deep the strings sit in the saddle. That's more than necessary. And if there's room, you know, I can always go ahead and plug those with some ebony, raise them up a little bit. The other thing to be mindful of is what kind of clearance we have over the neck pickup. And if there's enough adjustment in those screws to give like an eighth of an inch worth of clearance. I'm not sure if these screw heads can countersink in the way P90s do. Yeah, there is some downward adjustment. We should be all right. Okay. Well, I got things set at 5 64ths, which is pretty reasonable for one of these rockabilly style guitars. And looking at the amount of adjustment here, it's a little high, but uh, remember, if I plug these holes, I'm going to gain like a 32nd of an inch. So, you know, this could come down slightly. And in terms of the geometry of the fingerboard, we've got a bit of a rising tongue here where the wedge is pressing against the surface of the soundboard. So we're fretting out up here. But if I just press that down a little bit, so, you know, we're not far off. Now remember, I cleaned out glue and a bunch of stuff that was in the joint here that could have been holding the neck higher or in a different orientation. So this might not be like the way it was. Uh, I will probably take some sandpaper pulls through the joint just to refine the fit between the two parts. But this angle is functional. Um, I should leave it for a little while though, just to make sure that nothing weird starts to happen. Uh, I got an hour or two, I got a customer coming and then I got to answer about a dozen emails and tell a bunch of people I don't have enough time to fix their guitars because I can't do them all. But it's possible something might sink or the action might rise or lower, depending on which way we look at it, if need be, because there is, you know, some slight dipping of the top in the center here, which is kind of to be expected. It's a plywood guitar. It's not going to fall apart. Um, we could also, if, if necessary, put a prop in here between the pickups just to hold things up a little bit more. Uh, I don't think it's necessary though. I think we'll be okay with just gluing this thing back together and working on the bridge. The neck on this guitar is in really good shape too. It's got six thousandths relief. Good and straight. I'm making a filler strip for the saddle grooves. I'll have to thin it progressively for each successive fill. Uh, so I'm using the razor blade and some sanding. I get the width right and then round over the bottom uh, to accommodate that rounded groove. Chop off some of the excess and then glue it in. Later I'll trim it and uh, then I'll re-establish the grooves. Because in this case I don't want to change the angle of the neck, the sandpaper poles go out to the side here and they're full width rather than front to back. Uh, this is just trying to mate the landscape of the end of the neck to the body a little bit better than it is. I need to make a shim for the neck pocket, so I'm scraping some veneer. This is about 12 thousandths of an inch wide. I'll glue things up using fish glue in this case. The neck seats well and I can use that screw as a temporary clamp. The plane of the neck is okay. 
it's kicked up a little bit at the end still, so we'll take that into account when making the shim. This involves thinning and then transferring highs and lows to the shim, which I can deal with by scraping some gentle sanding. It doesn't take a whole lot of clamping pressure to put this together. There's a similar one on the other side. I've been spot dressing some frets around the neck to body joint. It's really kind of a roller coaster, which is sometimes unavoidable. Um, some of the frets are loose too, so I've been slipping some super glue under them. When I string it up, there's something not so great happening with the bridge. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it, but there's quite a bit of bow that's formed on the base. It's collapsing, and it's actually distorting the top portion of the bridge as well. Um, I've got the action I want on the outside strings, but there's enough sinkage in the bridge that the inside strings are actually closer to the fretboard. So I was thinking about what to do here. I got about three millimeters worth of clearance I can play with, so I think it might be advantageous to glue on a strip of ebony and try and stiffen that up in there. These old guitars, you know, they can take a lot of messing around to make work. It's almost never straightforward. I'll try and flatten some of the warp out by sanding, but there's quite a leaf spring effect happening here. I'll glue these pieces together on a flat surface. Here I'm re-establishing the holes. Well, I can't win for losing. I have no idea what that expression means. Things were looking good. I was stringing it up, and as I was just getting it into tune, I heard a snapping sound. And I realized that the bridge base had broken in the line from the corner up here to this inside corner down here. What I think might have happened was... The extra force needed to straighten this thing out meant it was under additional tension, and more pressure when it was on the guitar was being applied to the ends of the bridge. So in a design like this with a hard right angle for an inside corner, that's a stress point, and it failed when the soundboard sagged under tension. So if you can imagine soundboard doing this, that's what happened. Maybe it was hubris to try. You know, I probably should have just made a new base from scratch to begin with, because this certainly didn't save me any labor with the uh, reinforcement on the top. So, you know, I quickly glued it back together, but I don't trust it. I gotta make a new one. And for the replacement, rather than have this right angle in here again, I think I'm gonna borrow a piece of design from some Gibson and Epiphone bridges I've worked on, and I'll make this space here an, an arc or a portion of a radius, which, you know, doesn't focus all the strain in any one place. It gets transferred around. So I think this bridge may have been designed to be weak and deflect right off the bat, just so that they wouldn't have to go to all of the trouble of fitting the feet really precisely to the soundboard arching, which is fine when the guitar is new, but with the deforming that comes with age, it just, you know, it goes too far couldn't stand up to it. Big old plastic profile gauge. It's very handy. I'll transfer the arch and that will save me some time. Um, here I'm fitting the bridge base by sanding, which is more like marking the high spots, which I'll then get rid of with a scraper and then go back and sand again. So the guitar originally had a pick guard, which has since disappeared and the owner has picked up a replacement here, he's going to live with the fact that it's glaringly white in comparison to the aged plastic that's on there. Um, not much I can do about that. He was also concerned that the front hole isn't drilled. And though there seems to be a pilot hole on the back, kind of, um, you know, it doesn't line up with the hole that's in the guitar, and that doesn't surprise me at all. You know, some kid had a job on the drill press, and the location of the hole in the guard didn't matter that much because, you know, wherever it landed on the guitar, that's where the screw goes. You know, close was good enough in these. Um, what's interesting to me is that in the reproduction, the hole for the bracket screw doesn't seem to be the right size. It's a funny guard, you know. I looked at a bunch of pictures online, and apparently this does go over the pickup rings 
sort of centered on the pickups, but uh, I don't know. It's it's a weird shape. I don't like how this was executed. I might actually go back and sand this some so that it's a little more elegant in this area, if you know what I mean. I gotta look at the pictures again to see how it appeared on the originals, but I don't like the way it's interacting with the binding. It's just, it's wrong. Um, well, we'll see what happens when I put the bracket on. Apparently there's no washer either. I'm measuring the position of the hole in the guitar and transferring it over to the guards so there won't be two holes and I'll know where to drill. There are a couple of big scuffs in the upper bout which had previously been inked in but I think they could use a little drop fill of lacquer. I don't think you'll see very many more Harmony Electrics on the channel anytime soon. Stringing up. I'm pretty sure if you go back and watch the last two harmonies I filmed, it was the same thing, because they all seem to break strings. New strings, because of the lousy wire cutter tuners on them. And this player, of course, likes flat wounds. What are the odds I'm going to have a spare 24 flat wound G hanging around for just such an occasion? What are you going to do, spend another 25 bucks for a full set and just use the one string? He's got some at home... You know, I'll use a chunky plain steel string for now to get by. I have to wait a couple more days before leveling and polishing the lacquer repairs, but I think I'll plug it in now and we'll test it out. Um, 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 um.